Good morning. If you're new here among us, my name is Gene, and I serve here at C3 Church as your pastor. So I just want to start by thanking Tony, Tony Johnson. He did a very good job last week. You can call him Tony when he's here. If you see him at work, you should call him deputy. Uh, that's a good idea. <laughs> but anyway, he's not working when he's here, but he's working a lot. So he took some time out of his schedule to give me a weekend. I don't often get a weekend. I get maybe a day off if I'm really fortunate. So we got a weekend in the midst of all that is going on. And so we know what's going on with Hurricane Ian. So just a quick uh, update for you guys real fast. Uh, we're good. Our neighborhood is good, so praise God. Uh, he kept the power on at this building. Uh, pretty much the whole thing. It went out like during the wind event, but we came right back on. So we helped our neighbors. We did a lot of relief efforts. We had guys, awesome people, go around the whole neighborhood and ask everybody how they were doing, what they needed, and if they needed anything, you, AC, food, water, whatever it was, we had it. We even had chainsaws ready to go. And so this neighborhood was up and running pretty quick, and I like to think God had a lot to do with that, using us as the hands and feet. So now we're in the stage where we're reaching out. So we were over-prepared. Heather and I, if you know us, that's us. So <laughs> we have tarps and water and everything. All year we're thinking that this is probably going to happen, and so we get all kinds of stuff. But we have too much stuff now. So now I'm calling all my ministry partners, my mission partners up, and I'm saying, what do you need? We have stuff. But what keeps happening is, people are so generous, people keep bringing more stuff, which is not a bad thing. So if you know, or you know anyone, or you need a meal, we have two refrigerators filled with prepackaged meals. <laughs> so if you know anyone who might need it or you just have a heart to say, you know what, I'm going to drive to Fort Myers or somewhere where it's bad, give me 10 of them, I'll take them, good. Just make sure you say, Jesus sent me. And then that's it, right? So no selfies online. <laughs> but anyway, if you need to do that, go, go do that. We have tons of extra food. There's like bags of food, like grocery bags of food. And so all these ministry partners, they just keep giving me stuff. So plenty of it. And we have food upstairs. Let's fellowship together afterwards. Um, yeah, that's it. So if you want to be part of those efforts, come see me. Uh, I just want to thank everyone who's been faithfully giving. That helps. Uh, but now... It's gone up, so we need a little extra help if you can give it. Uh, it's a very fluid situation. So a lot of people will think, you know, like, oh, they must need this, and they'll bring, like, a ton of this, but I don't need that. I have too much of that. And so I know what everyone needs. And so it's fluid. Some days it's food. Some days it's diapers. Some days it's this. It just changes all the time, and I have to be able to work on the fly. So thank you. If you give, that's awesome. If you haven't yet been giving, now is a good time to start because we could use the help. We are pushing those efforts out to be a light in this community. So I'm proud to say we did that. Real quick, um, it comes up in the announcements sometimes, <clears throat> excuse me, but the Bible study questions, they follow the sermon. They actually go right along with the sermon. So if you download our app, C3 Naples, in any app store, you can go to media, then the Bible study questions, and you can pretty much follow along. I made some like easier ones this week for themes. So you can go to lunch afterwards with your family or your friends, and you can kind of go through and review the sermon. It's in there now. So you don't have to wait till Wednesday to get that. With that being said, let's get to the sermon. So I like my stories. And I heard a story of a pastor who was doing his work in a city that wasn't, like, spread out like ours. Ours is like a horizontal city. It has a lot of square miles. His city was like a vertical city. Think Manhattan, right? A couple square miles, big, tall buildings, everyone piled up on top of one another. So it's kind of like that. Now, in a city like that, if you're a pastor, you may not need a car. Right? You take public transportation, maybe you can walk to where you're going, and then there's the bus. So there's like a lot of different ways, a cab, a lot of different ways you can get to different places. So there's this pastor, pastoring in a city, and he's taking the bus all the time. But then he starts thinking, a car might be nice. Right? Because when I get on the bus, everyone starts talking to me, and I can't concentrate on my sermons or whatever. But then he thinks, on the other hand, maybe I should be on the bus talking to people. So it's kind of like this, he's having this push and pull. The car, gas, insurance, car payment, I don't need that. The bus is cheaper, but at the same time, there are conveniences. So he finally gives it to God. He says, I'm just going to let the Lord show me. If he wants me to have a car, I'll have a car. Something will happen, right? So he's seeking a sign now. Gets on the bus. He has this on his mind. He gives the bus driver a 10. 
clearly too much for where he's going. It's like two or three dollars for where he's going. Bus driver hands him the change, but now he has more than ten. Bus driver gave him like twice, three times the amount of change back. Goes back to his seat with it and starts thinking, is this a sign? Ooh, this could be God saying I should have more money or I should have more stuff. This might be a sign. So here's what we do. A lot of people do that, right? This is a sign because it's incredibly convenient for me. So, so he starts measuring it with this and then realizes, uh-oh, <laughs> right? This guy made a mistake. I'm capitalizing on that. This could be like stealing in a way. So he realizes he feels bad. He waits for a stop. He goes to get off the bus, and he just hands the bus driver all the money. Just, just take it. Listen, you gave me twice as much as I needed. I shouldn't have even sat there on it. I should have gave it back to you immediately. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. I apologize. But here's all the money. Back. Pay it forward. Bus driver. No. That wasn't a mistake at all, Pastor. I didn't get to the punch yet. Hold on. <laughs> it's good. Your head's going <laughs> to... No mistake, Pastor. Now, see... He was like, wait a minute, where in this story did I tell the bus driver that I was a pastor? So the bus driver has now accomplished something that's near impossible. He got a pastor to shut up. I'm like, so that's it. That's a <laughs> You can all laugh. <laughs> it was a pretty amazing feat, right? He's like, wait a minute. <laughs> We're friends. I <laughs> uh, <you> deserve it. <laughs> so the bus driver capitalizes on this moment of silence. No, he's not a bus driver. <laughs> and he says again, no, there was no mistake, Pastor. You see, I was at your church last Sunday, and I just wanted to see if you practiced what you preached. Mm. Will we do the right thing? even if it costs us. Small illustration there. So that's kind of the theme today. We're going to see. But it's going to take me a little bit to get there. This is one of these days where I am left with this much material, and i got to figure out how to get it to this much material. So I tried to do my best. You're going to have to work with me. So let's do a recap here so that we know where we're at. If you're new, it'll kind of explain to you what we're doing. We're in the rest of the story, but if you know the Bible well, you know that it's not chronological. There they're in sections, right? So you have your Torah, your history section, your poetry section, your prophet section. And so if you want to do it chronological, you have to kind of like, for example, take the prophets and go and put them back in the history section. That's how you do it, just like that with the noise and everything. So that's what we've been doing. We're taking all these prophets and we're putting them kind of where they belong. But we've seen that even the prophets themselves, they're not chronological, even within the book themselves. And so you're like, why? And I'm going to show you why today. One, just one example. And so when we go back, we had the fall, remember, of Judah, Jerusalem. And you had certain, before that, there was like a couple different sieges. And with Jehoiachin, certain prophets get taken away. Ezekiel and Daniel, right? They go away. And so they're in captivity. Certain ones, like Jeremiah, stay. And so we've kind of been jumping back and forth like that. So we looked at Ezekiel. We looked at Daniel for just a little bit. We definitely looked at Jeremiah. So going back to Daniel, we're going to come back to Daniel now. We looked at Daniel. We had, remember the diet, the Daniel diet? People like to do that for, what, 10 days, but I showed you three years if you're being serious about it. You had the interpretation of the dream, and then you had the three young men in the fire. And so the idea was, well, we go from fad Christianity to fire Christianity. And so we're following that idea. If you work your way through Daniel, you see certain themes come up, and they follow one another very nicely. And so that's what we're going to do. But here's the problem. <laughs> it's not in order, so you have to kind of figure out by the king's name or where you're at what order it's in. So I made a chart. There we go. All right, so no more jokes about the chart. I didn't make the cartoon. I did make the chart, so I'm responsible for the material if it's incorrect. Anyway, I think it's right. But Daniel's interesting because when you think about Daniel, you should think about him being taken away into captivity when he's like a teenager, just like that. He's probably a real young guy right there. And Daniel goes over a long period of time. So you have different kings, Nebuchadnezzar, so we saw the king of Babylon, then Belshazzar, his successor, and then you have Darius the Mede, and then Cyrus. 
This gets really complicated, and if you're not like a big fan of history, it will just like blow your mind. It's difficult because what's happening is all these different empires are coming and going and coming and going, and there's different kings, and then they have different deals with one another, and so this media Persia thing is complicated. So a lot of people just kind of go, think of them like the same thing, and we'll make it easy. They're not, and even when we're going to look at some of these like predictions, these prophecies, you'll see that the Medes, they're not really mentioned here in the section, so you're seeing four kingdom. So they're kind of almost the same-ish, but you can see what's going on here. And I can't see that far. I didn't put one here, but I think I got it. So you're going to start in chapter 7. Did I get that right? Can't see it. So you're going to start on chapter 7 and 8. You, know, you can't see either. That's not blind leading the blind. <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Never mind. Too many, too many tangents, right? So 7 and 8. Did I get it right? All right, good. 5 and 6 and then 9. That's how we're going to go. So that's kind of how it goes if we're trying to get this chronologically correct. So what I'm going to do for you guys is I'm going to start, and I'm basically just going to explain seven and eight to you. I could have just like forwarded my notes a little bit and then seven would have been there. I had to ask you instead. Anyway, not everything I say makes sense. Hopefully this will. So here's what happens. Daniel has a dream and he writes it down. So while he's sleeping or he's in bed, he writes down this dream. He sees a great storm coming and up out of the water come four beasts. Right? So uh, he's probably in his late 60s here if you're doing the timeline. So he's an older man. So a lot of time has gone by. Just View it like that. Old man now. Now these four beasts, you're gonna, it should actually bring to mind, remember the Colossus with the different types of metal that represented the kingdoms in that chapter 2? Think that, right? So different things represent these different coming and going kingdoms. So lion comes up. Wings, they're pulled off, standing like a human. That's Babylon right there. Bear represents the Persians. He has three ribs in his mouth. Represents the territories that the Persians took over, Babylon, Lydia, and Egypt. The leopard, again, the leopard has wings. Wings just mean speed, right? So with great speed, Alexander the Great plowed everybody over, right? He defeats the Persians and everything. The four wings, they're just, again, sections. You see, like, different numbers of things in their mouth or different things taken off or divided. They're just sections that Greece took over. Now, the fourth beast, this is when it gets really confusing, and people will go back and forth and speculate. It's not helpful. It has iron teeth, right? So this is, <laughs> this is probably two things happening here. Rome, right, because Rome took over the Greeks. That would be the next successive kingdom, and I'll tell you a little bit about what's going to happen here. But it says ten horns. Whenever you see horns in the Bible, usually it means like a king or a kingdom. Like that's what it means. So ten kings. So ten kings are going to go by here. And then you probably have a jump in time. And so when you're reading, you might have been confused reading Mark 13 or Matthew 24, where Jesus talks about when he's going to come back. And they're like, wait a minute. He clearly said that some of you will still be alive when this happens. But he, you know, so what he's doing, and scholars will call it like an ABAB pattern. So Jesus is going, then near future, far future, near future, and he'll just keep go doing that. And so sometimes this is what happens. Revelation kind of does that. This kind of does that a little. So he'll take like a jump in time, and it's hard to detect when that happens. But if you read it very carefully, very carefully, you can kind of get when this is going on. So what happens is there's a little horn. It's a future ruler. Again, this is where people debate a little bit. We're not really going to get into that because I don't want you to miss the theme. So then you're going to see his future ruler. He's doing all these bad things. Then the anointed one comes. Then the son of man comes, Jesus. So this is the Messiah coming back. So it has to be a jump in time. It's not about a nearer future than that. He says the Messiah reigns, messianic prophecy here, and it's about the future time. We turn the page, Daniel 8. I'm just going to move through these two things. We can, if you want to ask me questions, Bible study, we can do that. Um, again, during Belshazzar's reign. So it's now the third year. So early in his reign. Now it's the third year of Belshazzar's reign. I, Daniel, saw another vision. So this is kind of a funny one <laughs> in a way. It's some strange imagery. So he's a ram. And the ram has two horns. One horn longer than the other. And you should get this idea about the ram that it's complacent. That's the idea here, because now this goat comes out of nowhere, and he's going so fast that his feet aren't touching the ground. He has one horn between his eyes, and he rams the, 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 the 
ram, he, <laughs> the goat, yeah, I just confused myself. The, the ram rams the goat, I hope I have that right, did I get it right? <laughs> and tramples him, right, he's, he's done, he finishes him. But the one horn breaks off, and now you get four horns. Now, it's pretty clear what this is about. Uh, what goes on now is, is in the midst of this, so he, he has the vision, but then Gabriel comes and he's, I'm going to tell you the vision. And then Daniel's like, passes out because he's afraid of the angel. So then he explains the vision. He does what I did there. I put them both together for you. So what it's clearly about is, and if you know anything about history, Alexander the Great, right, he dies really young, and then four of his generals take over for him. And so these are probably the four, four horns. But out of one of the empires, the Seleucid Empire, comes this other guy. He's a really bad king. Antiochus comes out of that. Now, I don't have time for it, but we can kind of nerd out at Bible study. This is really interesting if you're within this series, because here's what you have. You have the Jewish people, they're like wedged between Ptolemy, that dynasty, just think like Egypt, and then this Seleucid dynasty. That's what's happening. They're in between. Now, it, there's so much here. The Ptolemies were the ones who ordered the making of the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, and that became the Bible of the early church. So really interesting that that happened. He brought the elders over, right, so to do this whole thing. So anyway, I've got to suppress, suppress the nerdness and move on. So anyway, here's what happens, though, and this is just a quick note. Um, if you have really educated yourself about the Bible, you know that your great-granddaddy's Bible his KJV had some extra books in it. There was like an Apocrypha in there. Right? And the reason they're in there is because right from the beginning of the early church, they were in there with no delineation. There's no like, hey, careful when you read these, you might get set on fire. There's nothing like that. They're just all mixed in. And even in Daniel, I'll explain this to you probably the next message, how there's just extra parts of Daniel. It's just different. And they have more stuff in it. Very interesting. One of those stuffs <laughs> is First and Second Maccabees. That was in there. Again, the Protestant 1611 King James Bible had these in there. They were in there. And there's a reason for that. Even if you're not thinking they're Scripture, a really good reason for that. Because you can't understand Daniel unless you read at least 1 Maccabees. You just can't do it. You'll never get it. You have to just believe implicitly what somebody else tells you. When you read this, they tell the stories of this stuff happening. Also, John 10 Right? So Jesus is going to celebrate the festival of dedication. He cares enough about it to go. It's not in the Torah. It's not in the law of Moses. Where is it? Maccabees. That's how you know about it. They're celebrating Hanukkah, right? the festival of dedication. They do the lights because they only had enough oil for two lamps, and it went eight days. But this is Judah Maccabees, so there's this guy, Antiochus. He stops the uh, religious practices in the temple. Stop, they build the gymnasium, they do all this terrible stuff. And when they, they're in the gymnasium, they're naked, so there's a lot of stuff about circumcision and crazy stuff in there. But anyway, he stops it. That's this guy, then Judah Maccabees restores it. And that's what Jesus is going to celebrate in the temple. So interesting, not a law of Moses holiday. So you miss stuff. And so there's an encouragement there. Take a look. Take a look at the extra books because it will educate you and you will better understand what's happening right here. So this huge historical intersection is happening now. There's so much going on. So Antiochus is seen as an antichrist. And the way you look at it correctly, you have to kind of go, he's, uh, Daniel, we'll look at this later, he's representing or foreshadowing something as well. So there's two things going on here. It's a near then time and then a far then time. So here we're going to get to the crux of our story. So <laughs> software update is waiting to install. Don't you love that? I turn it on early. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm trying to read scriptures here. Go away. So we're going to get to two stories. One you know better than the other, I'm betting. Um, so the first one ties to the second one. A lot of you guys probably know this story. You could probably like, you make your way through it. Daniel and the lion's den. We're going to take a few of these stories, and I'm going to try to show you things that you might not have seen before. And it's kind of interesting. So a good tour guide 
right? So if he's experienced and he's been on the tour a bazillion times, right? So like the new guy's going to go, oh, look at the elephant. You know, look at the giraffe. You know, but the guy who's been there for a while is going to be like, do you see that little deer? And everyone's like, no, and that's the point. You see, so here I'm going <laughs> to stop and let you see it. So that's what I'm trying to do, give you these little, little hidden Easter eggs in here. They're kind of hard to find. So the first one, Daniel 5.1. Many years later, so you see what's going on here there, the time, King Belshazzar gave a great feast for 1,000 of his nobles, and he drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver cups that his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. He wanted to drink from them with his nobles, his wives, and his concubines. They brought these gold cups taken from the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives, his concubines, drank from them. While they drank from them, they praised their idols made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, they saw the fingers of a human hand writing on the plaster wall of the king's palace near the lampstand. The king himself saw the hand as it wrote, and his face turned pale with fright. His knees knocked together in fear, and his legs gave way beneath him. So he starts freaking out. What does he do? Let's call in the magicians, astrologers, enchanters, these people, and see if they can figure it out. And he makes like a deal with them. He's like, anyone who can do this, I'll give you purple robes, a gold chain, and make you the third highest person in the kingdom. And they can't do it. Now, pause button. If you like reading the Bible a lot like me, here's a cool exercise to do. Genesis 37 through 50, read it. Read the Joseph account, and then read all of Daniel. Try to do that within like a short time frame. I do it in a day, maybe for you it's a week, whatever it is, just do that. You're going to see so many cool similarities to me. In my thinking, Joseph is like a foreshadowing of Daniel. It's really cool. Keep going, Gene. Anyway, so here's the thing. The queen mother comes in, and she's like, I know about this guy. He can interpret dreams. He has the spirit of the gods in him. So it's kind of an interesting statement. Okay, get him. So they get Daniel, and here's where it's confusing because this king is Belshazzar, but Daniel has like another name, Belteshazzar. It's like, you know. So anyway, we're just going to stick with Daniel. We're not going to use that other name. And so he makes him the same offer. I'll give you the purple robe, the gold chain, third highest in the kingdom. Daniel, he's interesting. Keep your gifts. Forgive them to someone else. But I'll tell you the dream. And so he goes on this thing, <laughs> really criticizing him quite a bit. He's like, your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, mm, he got arrogant. He reminds him about a previous thing that happened to him. He humbled that king and sent him out into like the wilderness of the fields. And he's eating grass like a cow. His hair grows really long and his nails are like bird's claws. It says, look, God had to humble him. You knew about this, yet you're going to take these things and worship stuff? Well, you take the, the, now the temple had all these things that they took out of the temple. So now these people are in possession of the temple, the gold cups, all this nice stuff. And you're going to like just defame this stuff. It's like, what? To your gold idols? And so this is the whole thing. He's telling him, you're disacknowledging the God that gave you breath, that put breath in your lungs. So this is what the writing means. Mine, mine, tikal and parson. Your days have been numbered. You've been weighed and you don't measure up. And so now your kingdom's going to be divided. And in very short order, he's rewarded. Like he gets the purple, Daniel gets a purple robe, gold chain, third highest person in the whole kingdom. Like real fast. And it just says, and then that very night, the king was killed. That's it. Darius the Mede. Now it brings us to that king. So Darius takes over. Medes, Persians, close. But Darius the Mede takes over in his position. Daniel 6.1, Darius the Mede decided to divide the kingdom into 120 provinces. See? And he appointed a high officer to rule over each province. The king also chose Daniel and two others as administrators to supervise the high officers and protect the king's interests. Daniel soon proved himself more capable than all the other administrators and high officers. Because of Daniel's great ability, the king made plans to place him over the entire empire. Think Joseph. Then the other administrators and high officers began searching for some fault in the way Daniel was handling government affairs, but they couldn't find anything to criticize or condemn. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. So they concluded, our only chance of finding grounds for accusing Daniel will be in connection with the rules of his religion. So here's what happens. 
So you think Joseph, if you know the Joseph account well, it's like, oh, yeah. So when you do things well, you will get haters. <laughs> so that's what's going to happen. So not that it's a problem that Joseph or Daniel are kind of like overachievers, but I've noticed in life, you don't even have to be an overachiever. If you just do things kind of right, like people hate you. So if that, you know, just be encouraged by Daniel and Joseph, maybe it's at work or something like that or in your life, and you know, people just criticize you. Haters. So he's got haters now. And so they decide to hatch this plan. They're going to go to Darius, and he's going to, they're going to like remind him, like, you know, uh, isn't anything you put in writing, like, it's set in stone, essentially. You can't change it. Yeah, sure. So they're like, okay, let's make a 30-day law that says in the next 30 days, nobody can pray to anyone else, no other gods, nobody but you. Of course. Darius is going to be like, signed. Like, that's kind of cool, right? So I'm God. They're going to pray to me. Daniel hears about it, but still, he goes up. To his room, opens the window, faces Jerusalem, prays three times a day. So he's seen doing it. The officials go back and say, Daniel broke the law. And doesn't it say that anyone who breaks the law, they're going to get thrown into the lion pit or the lion den. Yeah, but what did it say about Daniel? He wants to elevate Daniel. So this is a problem. He's like, oh, no, I like this guy. So he spends all day trying to, like, come up with something. Because remember, anything you sign, it can't be broken. Can't come up with anything. They come back. They really hate Daniel. They come back to remind him, look, throw the guy in the lines. So they do it. Now pay attention. A couple interesting things. So they do it. They roll a stone in front of the pit or the lion's den. And they seal it. And if you're getting, like, a literal version... They seal it with the king's signet ring and with the other nobles' signet. Like, this is a sealed deal. Remember that. So this guy can't sleep at night. So he can't sleep. He doesn't want to eat anything. He's having a hard time. And he gets up real early in the morning. He doesn't even get up. He just he goes out to the lion's den. And he calls out to Daniel. Daniel, did the God whom you serve rescue you from the lions, right? <laughs> Pay attention. Daniel, first thing he says Long live the king. That's interesting. And so, and if you're reading it in the Greek Old Testament, it's like for eternity, forever. It's like long, long, long time. So, may the king live forever. For eternity is a better translation. Then he acknowledges it. Most of you know that other part, right? So, somebody left that line out last time you heard the story. Right? But here's the thing. He acknowledges the Lord sent an angel to shut the mouths of the lions. And you've heard that. Then what happens? He throws the officials, right? In instead, the one who inflicts the punishment on you will get the punishment. Before their feet hit the ground, the lions tear them up. Then, interesting, Darius, like Nebuchadnezzar before him, becomes a God worshiper. Isn't that interesting? He praises God. His kingdom will have no end. And then he's like, everybody should worship Daniel's God. Makes that the decree. Very interesting. So here's the thing. Daniel, when you just back up and think about what we would do or not for God, you look at Daniel. Daniel is a man of incredible, incredible integrity. No, you keep this stuff, right? Unbelievable. <laughs> both of these stories, they go together. <laughs> they both involve Daniel having incredible integrity, but also telling or doing something. It's a king, this king is not going to like this. Right? Your days are numbered. So, you know, in our language, you know, right, because mine, mine, tikal, and parson, right? You're not going to say that to anybody. So in our language, think about it. You know, it's like going to someone with incredible authority and power. These kings are not like rulers here in America today, right? They don't have to get anything approved. That's it. What he says goes, just as we saw. Sign in a law. Good. It's done. So imagine going to somebody who has power like that and saying, you know what? Your time is up. You're out soon. You're going to be gone. And you know what? You didn't measure up. You're terrible at what you do. And then all that you've worked for is going to be divvied up. That's it. Not it, right? I don't want to be that messenger. I'm probably going to get shot. So he does that. Incredible integrity. Calls him out, reminds him about, you know, so anyway. So here's the thing. Doing what is right, no matter what it costs, is always Daniel's priority. Think about it. If it means losing everything, he just pre-gives it up. Even if it gets him killed, 
think about it. So here's the thing. During what we've been going through, let's think about recent times, some of us have learned a lesson about the futility of stuff, I hope, and not putting our trust in that. I hope. As Christians, where's our hope? The song. In Jesus. And that it, that's it. Not Jesus and here's my backup plan. No. That's it. If you believe, you know where you're going. And we see what happens literally when they get swept away. That's why Jesus, he ends the Sermon on the Mount with that. One who builds on my foundation with the torrents and the floodwaters rise and crash against that house because it's built on my bedrock, it won't collapse. But anyone who builds on sinking sand, it'll come down with a crash. And he drops the mic. <laughs> That's how it ends. Leaving you something to think about. Think about that. That is when our foundation is revealed. That is when. And it's okay, you know, just... I have no one in mind as I say this. No one in mind. So it's not about you. Just, But man, I can tell a lot about a Christian, right? And we have fear, and that's okay. That is okay. It's okay. I get scared of some stuff. Like Tony Johnson, I think he told you guys I don't like germs, right? So anyway, throwing me under the bus. Don't buy me hand sanitizer. I don't need it. But anyway, I don't like stuff either, right? There's certain things that I don't like. But at the end of the day, you know, I kind of reconcile it with Christ and go, stop it. You know what I mean? Like, my hope is in Jesus. I'm good. I am good. Right? So let's just work towards really strengthening that foundation. So if we went through that storm, maybe you lost stuff. You know, okay, are we going to learn this time? Right? Let's learn. Look, for those who have built their faith on the bedrock of Christ, look, their faith is a firm foundation. That's it. You don't worry so much about all the stuff on the news and all the other stuff. I have a compassion and a heart for people, of course. So I go out and help them, <laughs> right? I don't go, ah, on my way there. They don't need that. <laughs> they don't need that. They need like, shh, it's going to be okay because Jesus. So a question arises from Daniel today. Do you love God enough to always do what is right? even if it costs you dearly. Might not be stuff, right? It could be a job, right? telling your boss or doing what is right. And I'm going to get to a little side point in a second. But do you? To always have that type of integrity. No matter what. Like Jesus says, if it costs you your family, you know, will you always abide by my commands? That's a good question. It's a really good question. Now, here's the sidebar. I just, <laughs> I just, I said that on purpose, and a lot of people leave this out, and I hate it. <laughs> they will take the Daniel praying thing to, like, point to some kind of civil disobedience, right? <laughs> it's like, and when people do that, I'm like, you missed the whole point because of your attitude problem. That's really what happens there, right? So Daniel, he defied the king. He prayed. I'm like, you got to get your attitude in check <laughs> because think about it. Think, he has been so respectful to this king that he wants to place him like the top. He's doing his job better than anybody else. The king holds him in very high esteem. And what else? What does he say? The lines then experience. Long live the king. Interesting. So just a note there. There's a lot of respect for this king. Yes, he makes his point, but there's some boundaries there to these points. Many leave that part out. Here's the thing. We talked about this, so I'll do it short. Daniel typifies Romans 12 worship. He is Romans 12. What does it say? Be a living sacrifice to others. That is worship. He typifies that. Literally sacrificing himself. And we saw that when we look, yes, but it's a continuing story. Yeah, they had their wars and all this other stuff, but keep reading, keep reading. Look at how Jesus defines it. We saw Peter defined it, right? Honoring people and sacrificing yourself for them. That's worship. Honoring everybody, including the emperors, burning you alive. That is First Peter. We see that in Revelation. We saw Paul, most honorable Festus, right? 
He knew how to get the point across the right way. And Daniel is willing to lose everything, even sacrificing himself. And think about it. It's so amazing that he turns this person from wanting to be worshipped, calling himself a god, to worshipping Daniel's god. And we saw the saints back in the day, the early church fathers who got the point, guess they read their Bibles a little bit, that's what they did. Look at Polycarp. Look that up, Polycarp. Look him up. That's what he did. Fed the people who were about to kill him. It says the soldiers were converted by it. They just couldn't believe it. They're like, this must be real, because who would do that? Exactly. That's how we do it. We don't do it by complaining, by crying, by whining, looking like we have no faith at all. Nope. Our posture is firm in Christ. That's how we should be. Now, here's an interesting thing. We see a prefigure in Daniel of what happens to Jesus in the New Testament. This is where I really had to contain myself. I'm going to encourage you to read John 11. Actually, read like John 8. through Read all of John. There you go. That's better. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you another story you might know. I'm going to connect it to Daniel and connect it to Jesus. Hopefully, I'll accomplish that today. But I want to point out, again, a few little nuggets on the tour bus uh, for you. So, uh, okay. So here's the thing. So you have the account of Lazarus in John 1. A lot of you guys know that, right? And you say, rise up. And you sing that song about Lazarus and all this other stuff. But there's more to it than that. Yeah, like one person listens to the Way FM, so you got it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so there's a song about Lazarus, but that's all you get, right? You know, like, Lazarus, come out, and the mummy comes out of the tomb, and that's what you think of. But there's so much going on in the background of this that I want to try to, like, invite you into it. I'm going to stop the tour bus, say, look, there's a rare animal that you normally don't see. So you need to go back and think about John 8, what he says to them. You guys are children of your father. They're like, we're the children of Abraham. Jesus says to them, no, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not. Your father's the devil. That's your father. So he's teeing off on these people. And he says, before Abraham was, I am. And so he's, he's making himself the burning bush in Exodus 3. So I am the I am. And so they try to stone him. They want to kill him. This is used when anyone says, Jesus didn't say he was God. <clears throat> Wrong. They wanted to kill him for it. So you get to chapter 10. I mentioned, right, the festival of dedication. They used to call it the festival of Maccabees. Just so you know, it wasn't a bad word in the Jewish tradition. So that's what he's celebrating. And then he says that he's the son of God. Right? He's making that point. Again, they want to stone him. Right? He's calling himself God. They affirm it. We get to chapter 11. <laughs> and so you got to think about that. What he's doing is he's going back and forth between Bethany. So if you're looking at a map and I know there's a map person, but Bethany would be in the south. So it's by Jerusalem. And Bethany is like boop, right next door. And so they're going back and forth to Jerusalem, and they're staying in Bethany, right? So if it's too expensive in Jerusalem. But these are for the mandatory festivals, like the festival of booths, right? So we saw that in chapter 9. So back and forth, back and forth type of thing, or 7, right? 7. So he's going away in the north, like by Galilee, like the Sea of Galilee there, where everything started, John the Baptist, all this other stuff, right? So back and forth. So he's up north now. He's traveled away from the festival now. And he gets word from Martha and Mary in Bethany in the south, right next to Jerusalem, that their brother is sick. So they're like, come heal him, right? They've seen these healings and stuff. Heal him up. <laughs> and so, you know, <laughs> he waits on it for two days. And a lot of people don't really think about that. But it's an important statement he makes. He's like, no, I'm going to wait. He's thinking, so that Lazarus dies, <laughs> So that my glory can rise. So he knows he's got to let Lazarus die so that everyone can see him, raise him from the dead. So there's some back and forth about that. Within the back and forth, I want to point something out. It's really crazy. So finally, you know, he says, okay, let's go to Bethany, right? It's right near where he just almost got stoned. So like rocks thrown at him. Careful. So anyway, <laughs> I got to break it, bro. It's comic relief in here. It's for me, not you. So anyway, so they're, <laughs> they're like, you know, no, Jesus, they just tried to stop you a couple days ago. You're crazy, right? And so he gives this little speech. But here's what's interesting. Finally, they know they're going, and they could get killed. And Thomas, Thomas says this, John eleven sixteen. 16, Thomas, nicknamed the twin, Zithimus, said to his fellow disciples, let's go too. And die with Jesus. Now, in an effort, and this is what I think, 
to reconcile a character that we've placed pretty hard on Thomas. If you listen to some audio versions, they do something that makes me laugh. They go, okay, let's go die with Jesus. It doesn't read that way in the Greek at all. I don't sense that. I don't get a tone of sarcasm. I get, okay, let's go die with Jesus. That's the tone in the original. Interesting, huh? So let's keep the bus going, and I want to talk about someone else. Well, so, yeah, let's talk about someone else. So they go. Right? So there's a bunch of back and forth. But guess who comes out to greet Jesus? Martha. Huh. Maybe you know the story. Martha, Martha, right? Mary has all she needs. Mary's in the house now. Martha comes out to see him. And we get a Peter type of king, keys to the kingdom of heaven moment. <laughs> because Jesus is like, eh. Lazarus will rise again. She's like, I know, everyone will rise at the end, right? <laughs> Jesus, I'm the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And she says, yes. I know you're the Messiah, the Son of God. I just want you to stop and think about something in typical Christian storytelling. Who are those people? Two people with a bad rap. But... <laughs> This guy's willing to go and die with Jesus. So before we criticize him for not having faith, doubting Thomas, not all the time. There's another side to him. Martha, 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 you're so concerned with all these things. She confesses Christ like Peter. <laughs> what? Like she's a champ. Just a couple things that a lot of tour guides aren't going to stop and tell you to look at. Both sides of these people. So what happens? I'll tell you what happens. We use these people to make excuses for our sin. That's what happens. We've got to stop doing that, right? Because there there's a better side to each one of these characters that I would encourage you to look at. Right? <laughs> See, maybe I need to get my faith more like Thomas's. And say that to a Christian if they're like, huh? You need to read John. That's a problem. Interesting note. So, and most of you know the rest of the scene, but think, think, think. Stone rolled in front of the tomb. No seal on this one, I don't think. Stone rolled in front of the tomb. Jesus prays to his father. I know, Father, you always listen to me, but for their sakes, right? So they believe, and I'm praying aloud, right? Lazarus, come out. He comes out of the tomb. But it is interesting. Martha's like, it's been four days. The body's going to stink. So she still is very practical, even though she's very faithful at times. And that's what happens. So here's the thing. What gets Daniel in the lion's den in the first place? Continues to do what is right. He prays. He prays. <laughs> he does the right thing. But you know who else prays when things might not work out for him too good? Jesus. Agony in the garden, right? He's praying. We find ourselves in these positions. What do they do? The faithful pray. The faithful pray. And that's what they do. And here's the thing. <laughs> to the world, like, talking to my good friend Ed about this several times, like movies, right? So, like, everything's about, the way to sell movies or sell anything is you make the person the hero of the story. That's what you do. Am I correct? Like, that, that, that's American culture. The person, maybe not, maybe it's other places. Ukrainians can tell me. But, you know, the key to selling something is you're the hero of the story. It's all about you. So when we as Christians, and I hope you're saying this, I hope you listen to the lyrics of the last song we sang, it's not, right? We, we, we're like hands and feet. We're a part of it. But no, no, no. It's all about Jesus. And stop. And not, oh, did, did I think this? No, 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 no. It's all about Jesus. And I'm willing to just die for him. And you know what? Like, yes, I'm going to do so. What did I just talk about? Hurricane relief. It involved doing things, right? But what did we do? Prayed through the whole situation. Saw all kinds of miracles happen. But sometimes when we stop and we say, wait a minute, I might be making this about me. What do you do? What do you need to do? You need to stop and pray. That's it. Pray. Believe me, God will provide all kinds of stuff for you to do, right? But you provide stuff for you to do. So I know the Mary Martha thing. I'm not preaching to, into my argument too well. But anyway, stop. Pray. 
pray. And here's what happens. When we do that, and I've had it happen to me. I've had it happen to me. People within the church have done this to me. Like, Pastor, you, know, you need to get out there and do that. You need to be seen doing that. I'm like, okay. You know what I mean? But think, you know, my counsel is good because they tell me, you need to pray, pray, pray. And when I do that first, it's fine. Like, everything works out. And look, but the world sees that, and they're like, what's praying going to do? Because they all think they're God. They're not. God will sort it out. Just don't you believe? But Jesus encourages us. I showed you guys the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. Blessed are you when people insult you and mock you and persecute you, like Daniel's adversaries. He's praying. They're like, ha, got him, you know. So you're blessed. Could you, you just keep praying? Let them, but they're not doing enough. Pride, pride, pride. They're not doing it. Shut up. <laughs> I'm just going to pray. Pray. How long? I don't know until God tells you to stop. Just pray. When they mock you, they insult you, they mock your faith, you're accomplishing nothing. I know. <laughs> I'm waiting for God to accomplish it. And I also realize that he already has accomplished everything. I'm good. So I'm just going to have a conversation with him. You're interrupting. Thank you very much. <laughs> Jesus, right? They said, he accomplished nothing. <laughs> when we pray, relying on Christ alone, the faithless will mock us. The faithless will mock the faithful, saying we've accomplished nothing. So, I'm going to wrap it up soon. <laughs> Daniel 9. Let's go back to Daniel. Just a chart real quick just to show you where we were. Two prophecies. Right? Then the two stories that went well together, and then we end up at 9. And let's look at something. Daniel 9.1, it was the first year of the reign of Darius the Mede, the son of Ahasuerus, who became king of the Babylonians. During the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, learned from reading the word of the Lord as revealed to Jeremiah, pops in there, the prophet, that Jerusalem must lie desolate for 70 years. So I turned to the Lord God and pleaded with him in prayer and fasting, I also wore rough burlap, like wearing a wool sweater, so you just cannot be happy, and sprinkled himself with ashes. Just, he's lamenting. And so what he does, he prays to God, and it's very reminiscent of Moses' intercessory prayer. Like he's a big way of saying, getting in the middle of this situation and pleading for like an entire people, right? That's what he's doing. And he, they appeal to God in very similar ways. The thought is like, we don't deserve it. Right? But for your sake, you wouldn't want the other nations to say you let your people down. And so this is kind of like a repetitive thing. Daniel is praying, praying. We deserve the curses. We looked at those, Deuteronomy 27 and 28. You deserve the curses. We're getting what you deserve. But please, for your sake, Lord. So <clears throat> this is what happens. Gabriel comes again. He doesn't faint this time. <laughs> Daniel, that is. Right? And he says, you're precious to God. And so he gives this whole thing that I'm just going to go through quick. It's like 70 sets of seven. And so basically what this is, it, it's two different sets of time. It's a time to atone for the, everything that they've done. And then an anointed one will come. And here's what happens. Daniel 9, 6. After this period of 62 sets of seven and also the 490, it's 490 years probably, the anointed one will be killed, appearing to have accomplished nothing. And a ruler will arise whose armies will destroy the city and the temple. The end will come with a flood and war, and its miseries are decreed from that time till the very end. The ruler will make a treaty with the people for a period of one, sets, of one set of seven, but after half of this time, he will put an end to the sacrifices and offerings. And as a climax to all of his terrible deeds, he will set up the sacrilegious object that causes desecration or desolation until the fate decreed for this defiler is finally poured on him. So, don't get too wrapped up when people argue it's not this, it's not that. It's, not. it's like a little of both. It is said that this is the exact amount of time from this time to Jesus coming as the Messiah in 33 AD. That's what is said about it. Probably is. And again, you get this kind of back and forth thing, a future time thing. But I want to show you something here. If we go to Matthew 24, for example, I was telling you about the Mark 13 and Matthew 24. Matthew 24, 15, this is Jesus talking. The day is coming when you will see what Daniel, the prophet, spoke about, the sacrilegious object that causes desecration, standing in the holy place. Reader, pay attention to Daniel, 
Right? So this is what happens. The Romans take over. If you know 70 AD, the, they destroy the temple in there. So this, all this stuff is going to happen. But here, I want you to go back to something. When the anointed one is killed, it appears that Jesus accomplishes nothing. That's what this is about. And Jesus keeps bringing us back to. So if we go back to Daniel 6, we see Darius was right. It's layers of prophecy upon one another. I decree that everyone throughout my kingdom, says the raft of the lion's den, should tremble with fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and he will endure forever. I'm just going to jump a little bit. So if we keep reading, we just jump into seven, we get another prophecy about a future time. After the nations come and go, Daniel 7, 9. I watched, it's a vision now, as thrones were put in place and the ancient one sat down to judge. His clothing was as white as snow, his hair like purest wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire and a river of fire was pouring out, flowing from his presence. Millions of angels ministered to him. Many millions stood to attend him. Then the court began its session and the books were open. I continued to watch. I could hear, as I continued to watch, I could hear the little horn's boastful speech. I kept watching until the fourth beast was killed and its body was destroyed by fire. The other three beasts had their authority taken from them, but they were allowed to live a little while longer. This is what you got to pay attention to. As my vision continued that night, I saw someone like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient one and was led into his presence. He was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of the world so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed. Future time. Near future, far future. Check it out. If we go back to Matthew 24, Jesus continues. And then at last, the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens, and there will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and glory. And Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. He's referring to this. And when Jesus is on trial, he's about to be put to death, silent before his accusers, Mark 14, 61, but Jesus was silent and made no reply. Then the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? And Jesus said, I am. You understand that better now? We're going back to Exodus 3. I'm glad. And you'll see the son of man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus is referring to Daniel 7 here. Important, all this stuff goes together. And so as I close, I'm going to close with scripture today. And you will see how these things come together. It's magnificent. Revelation, a lot of beginners will say, teach me about Revelation. And I'm like, did you read the rest of the... Like, so we're going to start at the last chapter of the book. That's a fantastic idea. Almost as good as like your verse of the day where you're jumping all around like one line here, one line there, and so on random order. You won't get it. And that's the thing. Unless you understand Daniel, you will not understand Revelation. But now that you've at least heard it, go ahead. Now you're going to go, oh, you see beast and this and that. I get it. So I'm going to bring you into that a little bit. But an encouragement. Start at the beginning of a book and then read all the way through. It'll help you understand the last chapter. But we're going to jump there because we've done Daniel. So maybe you'll understand that. You see, Revelation is a fulfillment of what we see in Daniel, both in their near future, past, and in our future. Don't know when. Stop trying to figure it out. Right? So disobedient to Jesus. Not even the son knows, but I can figure it out. Okay, another arrogance problem. But <laughs> you know, I won't go down that road. So it's a fulfillment of what we see in Daniel, and I want to show you something that is beautiful and amazing. I am going to pair them for you and show you what's going on here. Daniel 7, 9. I watched as thrones were put in place and the ancient one sat down to judge. His clothing was as white as snow, his hair like purest wool. He sat on a fiery throne with wheels of blazing fire. Revelation 1, 14. His head and hair were like white wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. Daniel 7, 10. And a river of fire was pouring out, flowing from his presence. Millions of angels ministered to him. Many millions stood to attend him. Then the court 
began its session, and the books were open. Revelation 5, 11. Then I looked again, and I heard the voices of thousands and millions of angels around the throne and the living beings and the elders. Revelation 20, 12. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and the books were open, including the book of life, and the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. Daniel 7.11, I continued to watch because I could hear the little horn's boastful speech. I kept watching until the fourth beast was killed and his body was destroyed by fire, Revelation 19.20, and the beast was captured. And with him, the false prophet who did mighty miracles on behalf of the beast, miracles that deceived all who had accepted the mark of the beast and who worshipped the statue. Both the beast and his false prophet were thrown alive into the fiery lake of burning sulfur. Daniel 7, 13, as my vision continued that night, I saw someone like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient One and was led into his presence, Revelation 1, 13, and standing in the middle of the lampstands representing churches was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest, Revelation 14, 14. Then I saw a white cloud, and seated on the cloud was someone like a son of man. He had a gold crown on his head and a sharp sickle in his hand, Daniel 7, 14. He was given authority, honor, and sovereignty over all the nations of this world so that people of every race and nation and language would obey him. His rule is eternal. It will never end. His kingdom will never be destroyed, Revelation 11, 15. The world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. He will reign forever and ever. Amen. Jesus is coming for us. He will reign forever and ever. No earthly king is greater. We can't lose our investment in him. If our faith is built on Christ, we are unmovable. We will never be swept away if we are built on the bedrock of Christ. Just as God was with his people in exile, just as God was with Daniel in the lion's den, he is with us today. That is what we need to believe in. In the meantime, we trust him. We obey his commands. All our neighbors, as we patiently endure, even if it costs us, because it can never be a higher price than Jesus paid. So we await his turn, his return, in the hope of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.